Hi, and welcome back. You're listening to AMK at Purple Sky 11, and this is the second half to part 14 of my series of videos where I dig through the police files and evidence pertaining to the Benoit family murders. In the first half of part 14, we went over the investigator's summary of the poison determination and the DNA evidence. And now we're going to take a closer look at the test results that those summaries were based on. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss out on future videos. We still have a lot to go through in these police files and if you like what you see, please hit that thumbs up as it helps to get more eyes on these videos. If you'd like to support my channel, there's a link to my cash app in the description box along with a link that will show you how simple it is to donate. And a huge thank you to everybody who has donated. Your support means more than I could ever express. Every little bit goes a long way. I'm looking into purchasing an external hard drive for my iPad and hopefully that will help me increase video production. And now with all of that out of the way, let's get started with this video. All right, now we're looking at the Identigene and Expertox reports. So let's see what we have here. The first page says up here at the top, procedure, unknown chemicals and other toxins, procedure results, detected, specimen, other. And remember, this is the private company. This is the private company that the Georgia Bureau of Investigations chose to send these DNA testing samples to. So it says here, drug, unknown chemicals and other toxins, results, detected. Then it has the two stars here, which I think refers down here to details, but it says reference range not available. So is, is this saying that they detected unknown chemicals and other toxins? Because down here it says what was tested was water from a water bottle, not an original container, an empty soda bottle, and straws inside a green tea container. So those of you asking about the water bottle and whether it was tested or not, this is it. And if you remember, back in the videos where we read through the CSU reports, Detective Harper's report said that the clear plastic water bottle behind Benoit's body contained a small amount of liquid that had a green in color tint to it. And then in Deputy Sheriff Russell's report, he wrote the clear bottle with a small amount of orange liquid and a box of supplement were collected for further processing. And it even says here, that there was a wine bottle which was also collected for processing. Where's the evidence that they got from, quote, processing that wine bottle? I want to see it. What did they find? Where's any mention of fingerprints, DNA testing on this wine bottle? Why does it seem like important pieces to this puzzle are just missing? And then if we look down here at the details, it says Borneol terpene organic plant material, linaluol, scent in domestic products, vitamin E derivative. Now, I know that borneol and linaluol are terpenes that can be present in marijuana, but this is a toxin screen. It says unknown chemicals and other toxins results detected. So I'm wondering if maybe these things, the borneol and the linaluol, could be toxic if enough of it is ingested. Maybe that's why it's listed as a chemical toxin. But it wasn't only the water bottle. It says they tested all of this, water from a water bottle, not an original container, an empty soda bottle, and straws inside a green tea container. So where did they find specifically this borneol and linaluol? It, it doesn't say. It just says these were the specimens that they took. And I'd love to know why there's no specimen tested that was taken from the wine bottle and beer cans. At least now we know they did collect those items, quote, for processing. So now I just need to find these documents that show what they found. So I'll do my best to find those, but I did look up Borneol and Linaluol. And as always, I'll put links below to the pages that I looked at here on PubChem which is part of the National Library of Medicine on the National Institute of Health's website. We find the chemical compounds for Borneol. And the first thing that jumps out at me, of course, is that as far as chemical safety, it says it's a flammable compound. So I can't imagine that would be good to ingest. 
And then here, right below where it says date, it says Borneol is a white solid with a sharp camphor odor that burns readily and is insoluble in water. So why was this in a beverage? And then when we look further down here, we can look into toxicity and all of these things. This is a little bit above my head, but the links are below if you are interested in looking into that further. And then this is what I found on linalool. And it's clearly indicating that this is a chemical irritant. Same sort of structure here as far as the website and then the contents. And if you want to explore this further, the link is down below. If there's any chemists or anything watching who have any more information about this, please let me know. But if we look into the marijuana aspect, borneol is a terpene that is found in cannabis. And according to Medical News Today, terpenes are aromatic compounds found in many plants, though many people commonly associate them with cannabis because cannabis plants contain high concentrations of them. And it says that the terpenes create the characteristic scent of many plants such as cannabis, pine, and lavender, as well as fresh orange peel. The fragrance of most plants is due to a combination of terpenes. In nature, these terpenes protect the plants from animal grazing or infectious germs. And it says terpenes may also offer some health benefits to the human body. As regulations surrounding cannabis become less strict, scientists are carrying out more research into these possible benefits. And if you want to read more about this, the link is down below. But if we look here at... Uh at askgrowers.com. Here it explains the different terpenes and it says here, Borneol was used in medicine for millennia as doctors from Asian countries have harvested camphor for its positive health effects. And the following paragraph says there aren't many Borneol terpene weed strains available, which then I can't figure out why someone would put this in water or try to, especially because the info on the National Institute of Health website says Borneol is insoluble, so it wouldn't have dissolved in any liquid. So I don't know if these were just supplements Benoit added to the water, but again, seems odd to have a supplement that won't mix with water, right? I don't know. And as far as linalool in marijuana, uh, let's see, we'll stick to the same website askgrowers.com. It says cannabis strains with linalool have analgesic effect and their flower fragrance adds up to the relaxation. Linalool dominant weed usually has a comforting spicy taste that influences the endocannabinoid system of the body to reduce the pain signals. And this makes them the most preferred types of strains. This at least makes sense as far as mixing it in with water like a type of supplement. What do you think is up with this in the water bottle? Let me know below. But as far as any testing for chemicals or toxins, this is the only page we have. I want to know where's all the evidence of the steroid abuse? Do you see what I'm saying? The only thing I saw regarding steroids is what I showed you in part 13, that the only thing they could determine is that he injected testosterone within a few hours prior to his death. They couldn't determine whether he had been a chronic user. And since recording this video, I've been on a mission to find the document that Dr. Sperry references when he says there was an elevated level of testosterone. And holy shit, that opened up a whole new rabbit hole. And I'm going to be bringing you a video about that as soon as I finish these. But something's definitely weird with that. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that video. But let's see what else here, because now we're going to move into the DNA testing. So this is Identigene, peace of mind through DNA testing. And isn't that lovely? They have a cute little fingerprint there with it looks like a little spermy. Isn't that a cute little logo? But this is dated Friday, October 26th, 2007. So this is months after the autopsies were done. Is it normal that it takes this long? And is it possible that some of these samples could have degraded over time? We are only talking about a few months, but who knows? If you know, let me know. Comment below. And it says here, you can't really see it very well, but it says right here, it says blood detection. It says the following item was analyzed, and then it has the item number, and the description is the sock and tape, and the sample type is evidence. Then it says that a phenolphthalein test for the presumptive presence of blood. 
And a phenolphthalein blood test is a presumptive test that reacts with the hemi molecule present in blood. It says they are typically conducted on suspected blood stains prior to collection. Now that's interesting because this sock and tape would have been collected in June and this test was done in October. While a positive phenolphthalein reaction is indicative of blood, it is only a presumptive test and false positives are possible. Additionally, the reaction is not species specific. Positive reactions are not limited to human blood. So that's interesting. And this was done on the sock and tape. And this sock and tape would be the makeshift gag the investigators found in the trash. And it says right here, the sock and tape tested positive for the presumptive presence of blood. So this item is suitable for further DNA testing. So I'm not positive about this, but the way this is presented here indicates to me that of all of these items, this sock and tape found in the trash is the only item that had blood on it. If I'm understanding it correctly, I mean. Then here you can't really see it very well but it says DNA analysis and then it says the following items were analyzed and each one has their own little item number. So we have the white towel which would have been around Benoit's neck and underneath the rope from the weight machine. Power cord. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how intelligent are these people who are doing this DNA testing if they don't even know the difference between a cord and a cord? I don't know. Oh, and I forgot to point out that these items here are all evidence samples. And then we have the three tubes of blood from Chris, Nancy, and Daniel that were used as reference. So let's take a look through here. It's important to keep in mind as we look through this as to where each of these items came from. And I think this item in particular, the cloth tape, is really important here. This is the cloth tape that was used to bind Nancy's ankles that was underneath the power cord that's listed above there. So the tape went on first and then the power cord. The next items listed, the S-video cable and the coaxial cable, those were used to bind Nancy's wrists and one was around her neck and connected to the cord around her wrists. And then next on the list, we have the white cord or the rope, which was around Nancy's neck over the cables that were around her neck and binding her wrists. And then the sock and tape were found in the kitchen trash. So this is a different piece of tape than the cloth tape that's binding Nancy's ankles. So everything listed here except for the white towel was used to bind Nancy. And the white towel was found on Chris Benoit's neck and the sock and tape were found in the trash. The rest of the items were found on Nancy's body. Let me get rid of these marks again so you can see it but we're gonna just move down to the interpretation, okay? The tube of blood labeled Chris Benoit and the tube of blood labeled Daniel Benoit each produced a full male DNA profile. The tube of blood labeled Nancy Benoit produced a female DNA profile. The samples exhibited significant evidence of DNA degradation. So we need to keep that in mind. We have a full profile for both Chris and for Daniel. For Nancy, we just have a female DNA profile. We do not have a full profile. Is that due to the reference sample exhibiting significant evidence of DNA degradation? I don't know. A full male DNA profile was obtained from the white towel. Okay, that's the towel that was around Chris Benoit's neck. This profile matches the DNA profile obtained from the tube of blood labeled Chris Benoit. Therefore, Chris Benoit cannot be excluded as the DNA donor to the white towel. Okay. The frequency of this profile from an unrelated individual chosen at random from the population at large is less than 1 in 610 quadrillion. And it's listed here what this is. That's scientific notation of this number here. So we know that the white towel that was found wrapped around Chris Benoit's neck, the DNA profile matches Chris Benoit. And I'll use the images from the Penny Project again to illustrate what one quadrillion looks like. This report concludes that the chances of the DNA on that towel belonging to anyone else than Chris Benoit is less than one in 610 quadrillion. So that's a pretty, that's pretty good evidence, right? So then it goes on to say, a full female DNA profile with one additional minor allele at D3S1358 was obtained from the power cord 
Whoa, wait a second. What? We have a full female DNA profile from the power cord that was around Nancy's ankles and over the tape with one additional minor allele? So we have an additional piece of female DNA mixed in with the full DNA profile of Nancy Benoit? Is that what that means? Or maybe it's some kind of genetic anomaly? I don't know, I'm definitely not a DNA expert. The DNA profile obtained from the tube of blood labeled Nancy Benoit is consistent with the major component. Therefore, Nancy Benoit cannot be excluded as the DNA donor to the major component of this mixture. The frequency of the major component of this profile from an unrelated individual chosen at random from the population at large is less than one in one quintillion for the following STR loci. And loci just means the locations. And then those numbers listed there, like D8S1179, those numbers match up to the chart a little further down here. D8S1179. And then here, D21S11. And down here, see, they're matching the alleles. And STR, here on the National Institute of Justice, STR analysis is the most common type of DNA profiling for criminal cases, and STR stands for Short Tandem Repeat Analysis. And this link is below if you want to read more about it. But um, then it goes on to say, and we are right here after this long list of the alleles, it says, no conclusions will be made regarding the minor allele at D3S1358. So why aren't you making any conclusions about this additional allele? Isn't that important? If Nancy's DNA is the major component, then who is the female DNA of this minor component? But it goes on to say, a mixture of male and female DNA from at least two individuals with a major female component was obtained from the cloth tape. Now remember, this cloth tape, it was around Nancy's ankles and underneath this power cord, okay? The DNA profile obtained from the tube of blood labeled Nancy Benoit is consistent with the major component. Therefore, Nancy Benoit cannot be excluded as the DNA donor to the major component of this mixture. The frequency of the major component of this profile from an unrelated individual chosen at random from the population at large is less than one in one quintillion. And I'll put the penny project thing here so you can see what one quintillion pennies is like. So those are pretty good odds, right? That that DNA on that cloth tape was Nancy Benoit. And then it has again listed the STR loci, which matches up down here for these, okay? But then it says, Chris Benoit, and I'm right here now, Chris Benoit cannot be excluded as a possible contributor to the minor component of this mixture. The probability that a randomly chosen unrelated individual would be included as a possible contributor to this mixture is less than one in 2,800 for the following STR loci. And I'll put another picture here from the Penny Project and you can see what a thousand pennies looks like. So that's a huge difference from one in one quintillion. And again, this cloth tape that has Chris and Nancy's DNA on it was underneath this power cord. And this really bothers me. This right here, what is this? One additional minor allele. So, and that comes from the power cord. So who did this additional minor allele come from? And how did it get on the power cord that was around Nancy's ankles and on top of the cloth tape that has a lot of Nancy's DNA and a little bit of Chris's DNA on it? It goes on to say the same full single source female DNA profile was obtained from the S-video cable, the coaxial cable, the white cord, and the sock and tape. This profile matches the DNA profile obtained from the tube of blood labeled Nancy Benoit. Therefore, Nancy Benoit cannot be excluded as the DNA donor to the S-video cable, the coaxial cable, the white cord, or the sock and tape. The frequency of this profile from an unrelated individual chosen at random from the population at large is less than one in one quintillion. Okay, so Let's review this quick. They determined now that the white cloth around Benoit's neck, the male DNA is Chris Benoit's, the power cord 
that was around Nancy's ankles and on top of the cloth tape had a full female DNA profile with one additional minor allele. And then they're saying that the blood sample from Nancy Benoit is consistent with the major component. Then they're saying that on the cloth tape, 22108, 22108, the DNA profile is consistent with the major component. So it's consistent with Nancy Benoit. And then this is the tape. It's this that we find that Chris Benoit cannot be excluded but this is where the probability is less than 1 in 2,800 that it could be anyone other than Chris Benoit's DNA on this cloth tape. Then it goes on to talk about the S-video cable, the coaxial cable, the white cord, and the sock and tape. This is the sock and tape that was found in the trash. And they're saying that the same full single-source female DNA profile was obtained from these items and that this profile matches the DNA profile obtained from the tube of blood labeled Nancy Benoit. Okay, and, and they're saying that Nancy Benoit cannot be excluded as the DNA donor to the video cable, the coaxial cable, white cord, sock, and tape. But you know what they don't mention here? with those items, they don't mention any male DNA profile. Isn't that strange that the only male DNA on these items that were binding Nancy was on the cloth tape that was underneath all these other items? That even on the sock and tape, see, they're listed as separate items here. So even the sock and tape that was supposedly a makeshift gag, there's no male DNA on that item. Okay, are you following me here? Because this was really, this is really confusing. See the sock and tape down here with the other cables, all of these items only had Nancy's DNA on them. But this cloth tape right here, this has a major component of Nancy's DNA with a minor component of Chris Benoit, which means he cannot be excluded. But the mixture is less than 1 in 2,800. And why is it such a, a high possibility that this could be an individual unrelated to Chris Benoit? And what I mean by that is like how it says here, the chances of it being an unrelated individual are less than 1 in 2,800. That's a lot more of a probability than 1 in 610 quadrillion, which is what they say is the probability that the DNA on the towel around his neck matches the DNA reference sample from Chris Benoit. Are you following what I'm saying here? I mean, I know this is really confusing, but this is weird as fuck. I mean, the fact that there's no male DNA on that sock and tape that was used to gag Nancy. Do we even know for sure it was used to gag Nancy? Did they do a saliva test on the sock? This is just f messed up, man. Which reminds me of reading that the knot that bound Nancy's hands together was in between her palms. And when I read that, my first thought was, oh, okay, so technically Nancy could have maybe tied herself up. Isn't that an outrageous thing to think? She couldn't have done that though, right? She couldn't have tied herself up that thoroughly. She couldn't have done that, right? Well, I encourage you to look into the death of an individual named Rebecca Zahau. And I'll put a little thing up here about who she is. And I'll put a link in the description box to a video that shows a police recreation video where they're showing you how it's possible that what I'm about to say could have been done. The investigators in that case want you to believe that Rebecca Zahau tied herself up and then butt scooted her way to the balcony and tossed herself over the balcony to hang herself naked. So if they're telling you that in that case, which I don't believe at all, that she tied herself up like that, I don't necessarily believe Nancy tied herself up either. But I'm saying that we can see when we look at those two cases, if the investigators are telling us that in the case of Rebecca Zahau, she did tie herself up like that, then we have to assume that technically it's possible that Nancy Benoit could have done it as well. Could that explain why there's only Nancy's DNA on those ties? What do you think? And I know we're getting into a little bit of crazyville here, aren't we? With the things that I'm saying here. I know I've been trying not to go into conspiracy theories, but I wouldn't consider this a conspiracy theory. We're looking at the evidence that is presented here, and I'm giving you another case where the investigators tell us this woman tied herself up. And if you look into this case, you'll see she was bound very similar to the way Nancy was bound. So we have to believe in that instance, that it's possible to do. 
So looking at this and seeing that there's no male DNA on these cords, I guess we have to ask ourselves, um, is it possible? Could Nancy have tied herself up like this? And according to police investigating this Rebecca Zahau case, it's not only possible, but in that specific case, it was likely, according to those investigators. Personally, I don't think that it's very likely in either of these cases that the victim tied themselves up. But I suppose it is a possibility, which is why I'm mentioning it here. So, and then what we have here is just the results. So it's um, over here to the left. It shows you where the sample came from. And then it's showing you across the top the different, I don't know, alleles or whatever that would be. I, I don't, I don't know. But um, up here where it says that there was an extra allele right here. One additional minor allele at D3S1358. So DCS1358 right here. This would be the extra allele. And then as we go down here, we can just see all the whatever all of this means. And then we can see down here a little key to understanding this that in brackets, it's a minor component of a mixture, a star, it's possible additional alleles below threshold and the double star may be attributable to stutter. I don't see any double stars in here, so I didn't look up what that meant, attributable to stutter, but possible additional alleles below threshold. We do have a few items in the chart marked as that, so I looked that up, and I found this interesting article here, promega.com. Uh, it says that this is written by John Butler and Carolyn Hill from the National Institute of Standards and Technology Biochemical Science Division, and this was published in 2010. And it says here in the abstract, some effects inherent with analysis of low amounts of DNA yield allele or locus dropout. Additionally, increasing detection sensitivity can result in a greater potential for contamination or allele drop in. So that extra allele, the one that was on the cloth tape, does that mean that the DNA was contaminated? I don't know. I'll put the link to this below if you would like to read it further and look into this further. But, oh my goodness, I don't know how many parts I'm going to have to split this video up to. But um, it goes on then to have some notes here. It says, number one, DNA was extracted and amplified at 15 polymorphic PCR loci. And then it has the, the DNA that matches this chart up here. But that was tested at 15 polymorphic PCR loci and amylogenin. The DNA profiles of the evidence samples were compared to the DNA profiles of the reference samples, if applicable. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they had DNA profiles that they didn't have reference samples to compare it to? And I actually do think that's what that means with that additional female allele on the power cord that was around Nancy's ankles. And I think that's why it says in the report that they won't make any conclusions on that DNA sample. Number two, extraction and PCR DNA controls were tested and gave the correct results. Number three, population statistics, if provided, were calculated based on African American, Caucasian, and Southwestern Hispanic populations from the FBI database. Number four, Identigene will return all items of evidence to the address listed above unless otherwise directed. And that's signed Robin Deville Gudry and Robin Freeman. And I guess they were the ones who did this DNA analysis. This, um, is it weird that this signature just happens to be almost identical to the signature of Jonathan Eisenstadt, the medical examiner who performed the autopsies? I don't know. That's just something that jumped out to me, and I thought I'd share it with you. I'm sure it's nothing. <laughs> and then that is the end of the report for the DNA analysis. Well, that's all I have for you today. Please share this content with anyone you think might be interested. The more eyes on this, the better. The next video will be about Dr. Chris Sperry, who was the chief medical examiner at the Georgia Bureau of Investigations in 2007 when these murders occurred, and some possible corruption that Dr. Sperry was up to his eyeballs in. 
and in that video I'm also going to tell you about my adventure in trying to find the documents that Dr. Sperry was referring to when he claimed that Benoit's urine indicated a testosterone level 10 times greater than normal. Spoiler alert, nobody can seem to find it. Did it ever really exist? Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on this future video. So as always, thank you so much for watching. This has been Amk at Purple Sky 11, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.